welcome to Discovery Bible Church. Hope you, uh, you feel welcome this morning. And it's such an exciting thing to be able to come together and uh, get into God's Word together. And hopefully you find what you need. I think uh, we're never, we never outgrow the Word of God, right? Amen. We need it every day. And uh, it speaks to us. It meets our needs in many different ways. And it's just one of, the, one of those amazing things, right? It's active. The things that we see one time, we might go back and we see something else. And uh, God uses his word to strengthen us, to focus us, and make sure that we don't miss out on uh, the great blessings it is to serve uh, a risen Savior. So uh, we're going to continue in our study. We're in Isaiah chapter 41. Uh, chapter 40 was just... You know, I could have just kept going back and forth on that one. There's so much there. Uh, really, I think the, the most, you know, important thing that uh, is for, you know, I think for us to hear today, here Isaiah is being used by God to send a message to Israel. And uh, he's sending a, a message that, hey, I'm, I'm trying to crack into your, uh, your lives, to crack into your thinking. Uh, he's sending all these voices, uh, voices of comfort and tenderness. Uh, there's a reference to the voice calling in the desert, right? We know that that was applied to John the Baptist. Uh, but God, in many ways, is trying to speak into our lives. And that big question is, are we listening? Are we hearing what he has to say for us today? And not only that, are we listening and doing something with that? Are we deciding to act Upon that voice that we hear, that voice of God. And, uh, and that's the challenge, because the world is a noisy place. Our minds are noisy places, right? We, I think my message, main idea last year, uh, last year, last week, felt like a year ago, was that there are many voices in our head, but there's only one that truly matters. I guess I should have said one that matters most, because I think, you know, we have a voice that we need to speak positivity. We need to speak God's word into our lives. So we need to listen to those sorts of things. We need to listen to the voices of mature believers, those who are encouraging us to do good and right things. But more than anything, we don't want to miss the voice of God. And uh, so I think as we get ready to read the scripture for today, you're going to realize that uh, God is speaking. There's a voice to be heard this morning in his word. And uh I just want to give you a quick disclaimer before I, I continue, uh, once we read the scriptures, I'll, I just want to preface this because really I talked about the time span between the first 39 chapters uh, and the last 27 chapters, very similar to the Bible, you know, those who put together chapters for the Bible, I don't know if they were thinking of that, it just landed on that, but Isaiah is set up in a way that it's a lot like the Bible itself, in the middle uh, there were 120 years uh, where Israel would be exiled. Judah, ultimately, would be exiled. And, uh, and Isaiah is doing an amazing thing. He is speaking forward. He's speaking 200 years into the future to comfort and to minister to people he's never going to meet. They'll never know him, but they'll read the book of Isaiah and they will be encouraged. The 120 years... Uh, is when Jerusalem is destroyed, exiles are take out, uh, taken out, and uh, they leave some behind, and then they pull them all into Babylon. Uh, that's the 120 years. But not only that, now there's been 70 years of exile. And I don't know if I really emphasized that or was thinking about that when I talked to you. So Isaiah, in chapter 40, is... Uh, speaking 200 years into the future, after 120 years of uh, exile of all those in Jerusalem, and even to the end of the Babylonian Empire. 70 years the Babylonian Empire will have uh, been in control. And there's one that he's sending. Uh, and it's, he's actually mentioned specifically Cyrus. This would have been Cyrus II, the Persian king, the one who would conquer Babylon. And God's saying, hey, that Persian king I'm sending, don't forget that I'm in control. Babylon, that seems so great and uh, unbeatable, 
I'm in control of what's happening. So he's speaking words of comfort, and he wants to make sure they understand that person who's showing up, that person who is destroying armies, I'm sending him. And that should be an encouragement. God is a God uh, who has his hands on history. And he loves his people, and he's going to protect them and do what he promised. So uh, that's the word today. So let's, let's read the actual verses. This is Isaiah 41. And there's 29 verses, a lot here. But we have our explorer sheet. Hopefully you have one of these in the bulletin. This is to uh, keep us on track, to point to the various points that we don't want to miss in the verses today. So here we go. Verse 1 starts out once again. Listen. Listen in silence before me, you lands beyond the sea. Bring your strongest arguments. Come now and speak. The court is ready for your case. Who has stirred up this king from the east, rightly calling him to God's service? Who gives this main victory over many nations and permits him to trample their kings underfoot? With his sword he reduces armies to dust. With his bow he scatters them like chaff before the wind. He chases them away and goes on safely, though he is walking over unfamiliar ground. Who has done such mighty deeds, summoning each new generation from the beginning of time? It is I, the Lord, the first and the last. I alone am he. The lands beyond the sea watch in fear. Remote lands tremble and mobilize for war. The idol makers encourage one another, saying to each other, Be strong. The, car the carver encourages the goldsmith, and the molder helps with the anvil. Good, they say. It's coming along fine. Carefully they join the parts together and then fasten the thing in place so it won't fall over. But as for you, Israel my servant, Jacob my chosen one, descended from Abraham my friend. I have called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, You are my servant, for I have chosen you and will not throw you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. And I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. See, all your angry enemies lie there, confused and humiliated. Anyone who opposes you will die and come to nothing. And you will look in vain for those who tried to conquer you. Those who attack you will come to nothing. For I hold you by your right hand, I the Lord your God. And I say to you, don't be afraid, I am here to help you. And though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, don't be afraid, people of Israel, for I will help you. I am the Lord, your Redeemer. I am the Holy One of Israel. And you will be a threshing instrument with many sharp teeth. You will tear your enemies apart, making them chaff of mountains. You will toss them into the air, and the wind will blow them away. A whirlwind will scatter them. And then you will rejoice in the Lord. You will glory in the Holy One of Israel. When the poor and needy search for water, and there is none, and their tongues are parched from thirst, then I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will never abandon them. I will open up rivers for them on the high plateaus. And I will give them fountains of water in the valleys. And I will fill the desert with pools of water. Rivers fed by springs will flow across the parched ground. And I will plant trees in the barren desert. Cedar, Acadia, Myrtle, Olive, Cypress, Fir, and Pine. I am doing this so all who see this miracle will understand what it means that it is the Lord who has done this, the Holy One of Israel who created it. 
All right, why don't we stop there, and I'm going to finish reading the rest of it during my message, but let's have a word of prayer, right? We have busy minds. Who knows what kind of voices are going on in your heads? I don't even want to hear them, but uh, shouldn't we silence them in this moment? I've got voices. I'm trying to, you know, manage everything up here, and I need to let it go. The Lord will help me. So let's pray. Lord, uh, here we are before you, and we don't claim to know it, all the answers, and uh, and in a lot of ways, we mess things up, and we're, we're uh, in need of a, a point of correction. So, Lord, I, I pray that this moment is that moment where you correct the course that we're on, that you maybe draw us back to, to where we need to be, to be your people. And your word is powerful, and just to hear the determination you have for Israel, the love you have for them. And these were the covenant people, the people who trusted in you. And Lord, we trust in you this morning. We are your people through the blood of Christ. We've been grafted into Israel, and we rejoice in that, that we are included. But Lord, we want to be used by you, not just listening to your word, but putting it in practice. So Lord, help us hear what you have for us this morning. I pray that you help me in my message, that you would help me to be clear and useful. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, all right, so here we are, and uh, the title of my message today is, Your Idol is Falling, and I think uh, what you kind of see in the, the scripture today is a little bit of uh, taunting. God is taunting uh, those in Babylon who are shaking in their boots because there's a bigger, badder king who's coming, and uh, they don't know where to turn to, and uh, in the in the chaos... Uh, what pagans would do, right, is uh, turn to the gods that they uh, work with, I guess. They, they uh, fashion gods, and they put them on their shelves, and, uh, and they turn and pray to them for deliverance. But God here is trying to make it clear that, hey, when you measure all the gods that are out there, there's no god that compares to me. And that's the conclusion they should be coming to, uh, with. And as you can imagine, uh, the book of Isaiah in the hands of someone in Babylon uh, would be a, a great encouragement to say to those around them that, hey, we're in good hands, that God has this covered, that that king in Persia, that eastern, northern place that's coming, God sends him. And he sends him for a purpose because he, love and, he loves and cares for us. You see, Cyrus is going to be the one who no longer outlaw, outlaws uh, the worship of Yahweh for the Jews, and he's actually going to allow the Jews to come back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple and to be his covenant people once again. So as we think about it, right, this idea that your idol is falling, it's, uh, it's embarrassing to kind of think about all the ways in which people try to solve their own problems by making up gods. It's foolishness. The main idea for the message, the one that I hope that you don't forget, and maybe it'll bring you back, is in green text. It says, those who make up gods spend all their time propping them up. Not so for Christians. Those who make up gods spend all their time propping them up. Not so for Christians. And we're going to see it in the text today. Uh, it's embarrassing to think about all the labor that people would put into these idols. They would uh, fashion them. They'd find the right wood. They would carve. They would embellish uh, with gold and gems. And, and not only that, they would get to the point where they needed to make sure they set it up in a place where it wouldn't fall over. And it should lead you to that conclusion. Why am I doing all this work? When there's a God who will do the work necessary. It's a wonderful thing. The fact that God is a God who has been proven throughout time to meet the needs of his people. And you know what? Here today, the answer is he wants to meet your needs as well. And I think in some subtle ways, maybe we set up idols. We look for comfort and strength from the things of the world rather than the things of Christ. And it's a reminder today, wake up, listen. God is providing, and he's there for you. 
And I think uh, at the bottom of your Explorer sheet, I put two verses this week because I think, you know, really what God is saying to the Israelites sitting in Babylon, surrounded by all these pagan idols, some of them probably giving into it, because let's face it, the reason why they're sitting in Babylon is because of their idol worship in Jerusalem. And God is speaking to them in a way that's saying, hey, the court is open, the, uh, you know, the uh, depositions are being made, and the case is being put forth, and you have to decide. You need to follow the evidence wherever it leads, and you need to decide. It's decision time. And you need to make your judgment. Look, the verse, the first verse there, it says, Listen in silence before me, you lands beyond the sea. Bring your strongest arguments. Come now and speak. The court is ready for your case. Now here God is challenging them. Hey, you know, I'm about to put forth the reasons why you should trust in me. And, and you can bring whatever you have. And then let's decide. The verse in 21 that we're going to get to towards the end there is, Present the case for your idols, says the Lord. Let them show what they can do, says the king of Israel. There's a little taunting there, isn't there? Tell me all about your God and, and what he's done for you. How has he predicted the future? How has he met the needs of a nation? We're to make judgments. And we make those judgments every day, right? For us to walk by faith is to judge that God, the God of the universe, is worthy of my trust. That in the midst of chaos, in the midst of uncertainty, that God's grace is made perfect in weakness. In our weakness, when we decide to trust in God, His power is made perfect. And it gets applied to our lives. But there's a judgment to be made. Will I be impatient? Will I look to other things to prop me up? But the answer is, is the Lord is there. And he wants to be your source of strength. And it's just downright foolishness not to take him up on the offer. So where uh, that first point on your explore sheet. Who else do you know that guarantees success? Who else? I think as we think about uh, the court in session, uh, God is trying to bring about uh, some clarity of thought. You need to judge. And I actually, interestingly, I was speaking to someone and, uh, and they're not, they weren't, you know, they're not Christians. And I brought up the word judge and they instantly did what? What did they say? It's the favorite Bible quote from the non-Christian. Judge not lest ye be judged. And I, you know, and, and what do you do? You know, I think the understanding of that context is I'm not supposed to go around condemning people. I judge you, you know, to eternal separation. That's not my job. But when it comes to life and it comes to reason and wisdom and discernment, aren't we to make good judgments? And I tried to share that. Hey, judging is a good thing. Because we have to judge between a lie and the truth. We have to judge between a God who can truly help us and one that has been made up that we've accepted or molded in our own image so we can have what we want. We have to judge for ourselves. And this is an invitation of God. Come on into the courtroom. Let me tell you some things about who I am and what I've done. The question is, are you going to be responsible and reasonable with that information? Or do you want to play the fool, right? You want to keep your head in the sand. And God will let you take the helm and, and ride uh, that ship into the rocks. You're in control. So, you know, when Paul pleaded in the synagogues with these Jews who didn't see that Jesus was the Messiah, he pleaded with them because they had to make a judgment based on the evidence. And if they didn't, they would go the way of, of whatever they thought was going to help them and, and in the process miss out on the greatest gift ever given. So here you are. You sit on that judicial bench for your soul. And the question is, are you going to 
make a right and good judgment? John 7, 24, uh, Jesus was talking to these religious people. They were mad because he healed on the Sabbath. And he said to them, he said, look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Here's Jesus telling someone to make a judgment. You're mad at me for healing on the Sabbath. Read between the lines. Who's the one that can work on the Sabbath? Who's the one that gave you the Sabbath? Make good judgments. Judge correctly. Proverbs 3.21. Uh, it says, My child, don't lose sight of common sense and discernment. Hang on to them, for they will refresh your soul. They are like jewels on a necklace. We are to judge and to judge well. We are to judge between good and evil, between uh, what is rational given the evidence we have for the Lord. Here God is reasoning from the history of the Jewish nation, but we can reason from the history of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. What is the evidence for why you should trust in Jesus? Well, look at his life. Look what he said. More than that, look what he's done. He was crucified. He died. Yet death could not hold him. What, greatest, what greater evidence would you need, right? Case closed. If you're responsible and if you're reasonable. Or maybe you're just trying to avoid the truth. Because you'll have to change. All I can say is those who make up gods, you're going to spend all your time propping them up, but not so for the Christians. We have a God who functions, who works on the behalf of his followers. And, I'm, and I'd love to be able to tell people that. So who else do you know that guarantees success? Here we see verse 2 through 4. He's making sure that, hey, this king that's coming, just understand, I have sent him. He talks about, uh, you know, all that he's going to do, but he's asking the question, who has stirred up this king? Who gives this man victory? Who has done such mighty deeds, summoning new generation from the beginning of time? And he says, hey, it's me. He says, it is I, the Lord, the first and the last. I alone am he. We're in the court. I'm presenting my case. Do you have any other options? I think some may think, well, maybe, you know, this Cyrus is going to be a quasi-savior on the scene, right? He's going to allow them to go back to Jerusalem. Maybe they'll revere him or look to him as the savior of Israel. But God's saying, no, no, I sent him. And you know what? God sends relief into our own lives. Has anything ever happened and, and you stopped and thought, wow, I was in the right place at the right time? Not so, says the Christians. There is no luck in God's world. When good things happen, I like to say, thank you, Lord. I appreciate what you brought before me. You know, I, I know that I didn't happen to be in the right place at the right time. God is working things out for our good, even discipline. Anyone here ever thank God for discipline? Not so easy. Sometimes we think, oh, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't, know, I don't know. I would be leery of making that judgment. There's a God who works out your discipline and protection. And that's the Lord, the first and the last. And, uh, and we know, right, uh, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus takes that title. Here's a title only Yahweh can claim. I am the first and the last. But in the book of Revelation, Jesus calls himself, I'm the first and the last. There is no other. So we can rejoice in that, that we have made right judgments. I think the fact that you're in the building, there's a good chance that you have accepted Jesus as that one God who actually will help, will show up. 
I kind of get all, uh, I, I like sarcasm myself. You know, most men like sarcasm. That's how we communicate. When you get together, I can only imagine the difference between a men's breakfast and a lady's Bible study. You know, the ladies sit, they're having tea, and they're, they're talking, and they're encouraging each other. And, you know, you, most men, they come together, and they're making snide remarks, digging each other. Uh, that's just kind of how we like to communicate. So when I see God using a little, uh, you know, I don't even know if you'd call it sarcasm, but he's chiding them. He's making fun of their uh, idols. And rightfully so, right? It's ridiculous. You should be embarrassed. But that's what people do. And I know that's what they're doing still today. It's a strange thing to see. People are turning to all sorts of... Uh, of gods that they think are going to get them out of trouble. There's people that use tarot cards. There's people that use horoscopes. There are people that are turning, uh, once again, to Thor and Odin. It's very strange. You see people wearing this hammer around their neck, and that's the symbol of a pagan god. And, uh, and you wonder, the question goes forth in this courtroom, is what has Thor ever done for you? What has he ever predicted in history? When has he ever showed up to your dilemma? It says in verse 5, The lands beyond the sea watch in fear. Remote lands tremble and mobilize for war. And then what does that stir up? It's an industry. The idol makers come out. We've got this covered. I've got this newfangled idol that we're fashioning right now. And and uh, and he's making fun of it. He's saying, you know, they're encouraging each other. You, all right, this is going to be the best idol ever. And the molders helping out at the anvil. Good, it's coming along fine. And in the end, all the labor and work that they've put into this idol, you know, here's my, my object lesson. Here's this beautiful idol that's going to get us out of all the trouble. And what's God say? Make sure you hold it upright because it would be horrible if it fell over. And that's your God. You're the one propping up your God to meet your needs. And this is just some silly thing that my wife will mock me about. But, uh, but just imagine a little idol you put on the shelf and you pray, you put little things in front of it, and, and you talk to this thing that you fashioned, that you propped up so it wouldn't fall over. Is that foolishness? There are people in this world foolish enough to trust in a God that they've fashioned of their own creation. And I'll tell you, it's happened in the Christian church. They have taken the image of God and they have hammered it, they have cut it down, and they've made an idol of their own, a God who no longer holds the opinions that he holds in here. And they set up that false Christ, and they pray to it, and they talk to it, but the reality is that Christ doesn't exist. It falls on deaf ears. You've propped that idol up, but that idol can't help you, and, and it should be embarrassing. So the question is, who really cares? I think Isaiah is bringing this message from God to a people who have been in Babylon for 70 years, and God is sending them reminders. Hey, there's a history. We have a history. It says in verse 8, But as for you, Israel my servant, Jacob my chosen one, descended from Abraham my friend. And I have called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, You are my servant, for I have chosen you, and you will not, and, and will not throw you away. It's pretty neat what it's saying here. It's kind of this descent back. Where did Israel come from? Well, Israel was created, the nation of Israel was created for a purpose, to minister to the world through what it would produce. But Israel started from another one called Israel. His name was Jacob. He was chosen out of Esau and Jacob to be that that one that would become a nation. But really, where did Jacob come from? Jacob came from uh, a descendant of Abraham. And it says, Abraham, my friend. I love the fact that he refers to Abraham as his friend. What did Abraham do that was friend-worthy? He listened, and he believed, and he acted on that belief. 
And because of that, he had the true God on his side. So what are we going to do with that information, right? God can do uh, what God can do with one man willing to listen and believe, right? Israel, the nation of Israel, Jacob, Abraham, what God can do with someone who will listen and act on that. And the question is, have you been listening? Have you been acting? Is the message that God brings to you individually, personally, something that you act on? I can only hope, right? We're going to end our service uh, in a little while singing trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. That's where we're making that right and good judgment. There's no other God to follow, no other God to turn to. And that little bit of faith, man, God can do great things with someone willing to listen and to trust. Let's look at Matthew uh, 17, if you want to turn your Bibles. A good section of Scripture. Matthew 17, 14 through 20. Just a nice section of Scripture as we think about, right? What, what gets unleashed in someone that makes the right judgment to trust the God who truly does exist? It says, at the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. And so I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. And then Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And then Jesus rebuked the demon and the boy, and it left him. And from that moment, the boy was well. Afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast out that demon? And then he said, you don't have enough faith. And Jesus told them, I tell you the truth. If you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. The power of faith. The power of turning to the one true God. Don't underestimate what it could do in your life. So the question in, in the, the second point in your explorer sheet, who does all the work with your God? The fact that you're propping up your God is kind of embarrassing. And, and hopefully uh, those who w live through their lives, and we don't live the lives of people that have false gods. I'd like to think it's quite dis disappointing, right? They sit there wondering what difference is that my uh, faith in this God make? So the third point on your explorer sheet, I guess I better keep moving here. Who cares for you like I do? Here God in the courtroom is presenting uh, the case of, you know, what does it mean to not have a God that you can trust in, that is strong? Talks about fear. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. So it's kind of like this parallel. You have uh, uh, an idol that you need to prop up, and you need to do all the work for this thing. Here God is saying, I'll do the work. I'll do the helping. You won't have to prop me up. Just depend on me. And he says all your angry enemies lot will you know, be confused and humiliated. Anyone who opposes you will die and come to nothing. You will look in vain for those who tried to conquer you. Those who attack you will come to nothing. And isn't that the truth, right? We are afraid of so many things. But when we follow the Lord, we can look back on what we used to fear and say, where are they now? Where are the things that I was so afraid of? The confidence that having the true God brings is just an amazing thing. And I was thinking all the ways in which that plays out, right? We can look the devil in the eye and we can say, you've got nothing on me. We can actually look death in the eyes. 
without fear. And we can say, you know what? It won't be the end. Because I have a God who will meet my needs. What a confidence builder. So who cares for you like I do is, is what he's asking. And that fourth point is, uh, who, re- who replaces your fear with victory? The Lord Jesus Christ has given us victory. So who replaces your fear with victory? And that last point, who turns you into something spectacular? And you are something spectacular. Can I say that? You are spectacular in Christ. You're amazing. You can do amazing things. I don't know if you underestimate how spectacular you are. Verse 14 kind of goes in a place that, you know, it's a little uncomfortable. Here, Jacob, right, thinking uh, the descendants of Jacob, the Israel, reading this verse, probably kind of, that's a little embarrassing. He says, though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, you are a lowly worm. I think I actually referred to myself as a, a worm this week as I was speaking to this person about, you know, what it means to be a Christian and, and hey, just get it right. It's not about me. I don't have it all together. I'm not great. I'm just a worm. And what's a worm, right? You ever see on a spring rain, maybe you've seen it recently, the rain comes and the worms all come out of the ground because they don't want to drown, and they find themselves in the middle of some paved driveway, right? And then the sun comes out, and the water gets evaporated, and that poor worm is sitting there. He's got no legs to run no hands to crawl. He's just kind of... How many of you actually will pick the worm up and throw it back in the grass? <laughs> some of us. Some of us don't want to touch worms. Where's your compassion for the worm? God has compassion on the worm of Jacob. Here you are in Babylon, powerless, without any ability to care for your needs. But that's okay. Because you got one thing right. You got me right. So he's sharing, though you are a worm, lowly worm, O Jacob, don't be afraid, people of Israel, for I will help you. I am the Lord, your Redeemer. I am the Holy One of Israel. And you will be a new threshing instrument. Ooh, there's the transition from worm to new threshing instrument. I like the sound of that, right? I can go from being helpless, worthless, to being a tool, an instrument. And I think that's where that whole spectacular transition occurs. I was a worm, but now I'm spectacular. I like the sound of that. And and maybe you're asking yourself, how am I spectacular? Well, let me tell you. I think one of the best things that we have, the thing that makes us uh, just a wonderful uh, person, wonder, I guess, a, a new creation, right, to be new in Christ, and then that that wonderful information we have, when our life is transformed, we can point people to the source of where true power and strength reside. You can tell others, hey, you can be spectacular, you can be amazing, you can be made new, and you can be beloved before God by making a right judgment about Christ. And I think, you know, the miracle that Jesus performs in the heart of someone who is broken and has trusted in him is profound. And I think the the way in which, uh, and it's interesting to talk about Israel, like what is God saying to Babylon? You're going to be a, a new threshing instrument to the nations? How is it that they're going to do that? And, and I think what we see here is this veiled, you know, looking forward to the, the, the age when those who know Christ will be that instrument. We go forth in the world like a, a threshing instrument, bringing faith to all who will listen. We bring the gospel of the good news, and the question is, what are you going to do with it? I've shared with you the the good news of Jesus Christ and his life. What are you going to do with it? And it begins to thresh. It begins to divide. It begins to move, right, the wheat from the chaff, chaff, chaff 
So in a way, you know, like this guy I was sitting down with, and, and he's depending on a philosophy of purification that he's going to get better and better with each life that he lives. And, and I'm challenging him, you've got one life, and you're going to miss it. Don't miss it. The ultimate thing is, what are you going to do with your sin? You think you're going to get to a point where you don't sin any longer. I'm saying you're going to stand before a holy God in sin, and you're going to be in trouble. I was trying to hold court that day. Christ is the answer. He's the one that will turn our fear into victory. And he'll make our lives vessels of the Holy Spirit, right? What's so spectacular about you? You have the Spirit of God in you. And that's amazing. And you have the ability to do what what he's talking about, right? We know Jesus is the one that brings that living water to those willing to turn to him. He's the one that can plant a tree in the desert. He can produce fruit from the most barren place. Why don't we uh, finish reading the rest of Isaiah uh, 41. We'll end there. Verse 21 comes right back around to that courtroom, right? Present the case for your idols, says the Lord. Let them show what they can do, says the king of Israel. A little more chiding here. Let them try to tell us what happened long ago so that we may consider the evidence. Or let them tell us what the future holds so we can know what's going to happen. Yes, tell us what will occur in the days ahead. And then we will know you are God's. Just a little side note here. Really, I think, you know, I've heard it said that really the Bible is the only prophetic religion there are there is. You know, when you look at all the prophecy about Jesus and the future to come, nothing can hold the light to the word of God. It is prophetic. You cannot find that anywhere else. It is making predictions. It's looking back and explaining things. And, and God here is saying, let me see your God do that. And it says in the the middle of verse 23, in fact, do anything, good or bad. Do something that will amaze and frighten us. There's mockery. Mockery. Do something. But no, and here's the hammer, you are less than nothing and can do nothing at all. Those who choose you pollute themselves. You are less than nothing and can do nothing at all. Those who choose you pollute themselves. Because that's ultimately what you do with a false god. You become like that god. Psalm 135 speaks about it. Talks about idols saying they're mere silver and gold, shaped by human hands. They have mouths that cannot speak, eyes that cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, and mouths but cannot breathe. And look what it says in verse 18. This is Psalm 135, 18. You don't have to go there, but I'll read it to you. It says, those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. You'll become blind to the truth, and you'll live in your happy little world, but you'll be self-deceived. Isaiah ends uh, chapter 41 speaking of that leader that's approaching And then, once again, God's saying, who told you from the beginning that this would happen? Who predicted this, making you admit that he was right? No one said a word. Verse 27, it says, I was the first to tell Zion, look, help is on the way. And I will send Jerusalem a messenger with good news. Not one of your idols told you this. Not one gave an answer when I asked, see, They are all foolish, worthless things. All your idols are as empty as the wind. I think one of the best things that we can do is to tell someone that whatever it is you're trusting in is unworthy and cannot help you. Only the God of the Bible, only Jesus Christ can get you through. So let's take a moment to pray. Lord, it's a, it's a strange thing that people are so desperate to be in control, so desperate to, to get what their, their passions want, that they're willing to fashion their own gods and uh, embarrassingly prop them up and, and uh, feed them and do all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, 
They do no work for them. Lord, you've done the work that we need. You continue to do the work in us. Your spirit is constantly uh, empowering us, directing us, and, uh, and we're, we're grateful for that. And uh, we don't want to sit by idly and, and let others uh, be doomed because of their poor choice. Help us to, to do what Paul did. He pleaded with those in the uh, synagogues. Help us to plead with our friends and loved ones. Help us to show that uh, Christ is the only God worthy of worship, the only God that can help. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.